Greetings all, witches and wizards of Hogwarts Academy. We come to you once again with another tale of Beetle the Bard. Yaniel of Gryffindor House will read another story, the great tale of Rabbity Babbity. We hope that in these times of great need you have enjoyed her stories and times of tales. Without further ado, my children, we welcome her back to read another story of Beetle the Bard's journey across the wonderful wizarding world of Harry Potter. Hello everyone, welcome to another magnificent tale of wonder and fun. Now, again? How is it possible this little book, children, where's the book? Do, do, behind me? You, you see it? No, oh. <gasps> Now, on with our tale, you mischievous little thing. <sighs> Today's story is Rabbity Babbity and her cackling stump. A long time ago in a far off land, there lived a foolish king who decided that he alone should have the power of magic. Therefore, he commanded the head of his army to form a brigade of witch hunters and issued them a pack of ferocious black hounds. At the same time, the king caused proclamations to be read in every village and town across the land. Wanted by the king, an instructor in magic. Now, as you can imagine, no true witch or wizard dared volunteer for the post. They were all hiding from the brigade of the witch hunters. However, a cunning charlatan with no true magic power saw a chance of enriching himself and arrived at the palace, claiming to be a wizard of enormous skill. The charlatan performed a few simple tricks that convinced the foolish king of his magical powers, and he was immediately appointed Grand Sorcerer-in-Chief. The king's private magic master. Now the charlatan bade the king give him a large sack of gold so that he might purchase wands and other magical necessities. He also requested several large rubies to be used in the casting of curative charms, a silver chalice or two for storing and maturing of potions. All these things the foolish king supplied. The charlatan stowed this treasure safely in his own house and quickly returned to the palace grounds. He did not know that he was being watched by an old woman who lived in a hovel on the edge of the grounds. Her name was Babbity, and she was the washerwoman who kept the palace linens soft, fragrant, and white. Peeping from behind the dryer sheets, Babbity saw the charlatan snap two twigs from one of the king's trees and disappear off into the palace. The charlatan gave one of the twigs to the king and assured him that it was a wand of tremendous power. It will only work, however, said the charlatan, when you are worthy of it. Every morning the charlatan and the foolish king walked out on the palace grounds where they waved their wands and shouted nonsense at the sky. The charlatan was careful 
to perform more tricks so that the king remained convinced of his grand sorcerer skill of the power of the wand that had cost so much gold one morning as the charlatan and the foolish king were twirling their twigs and hopping in circles and chanting meaningless rhymes a loud cackling reached the king's ears <laughs> babity the washerwoman was watching the king and the charlatan from the window of her tiny cottage <laughs> and she was laughing so hard she soon sank out of sight sight too weak to stand i must look so undignified to make the old washerwoman laugh so said the king he seized his hopping and his twirl twirling and frowned i grow weary of practice when shall i be ready to perform real spells in front of my subject sorcerer the charlatan tried to soothe his pupil assuring him that he would soon be capable of astonishing feats of magic but Babylonie's cackling had stung the foolish king more than the charlatan knew. Tomorrow, said the king, we shall invite our court to watch their king perform magic. The charlatan saw the time had come to take his treasure and flee. <clears throat> Alas, your majesty, that is impossible. I had forgotten to tell your majesty that I must set off on a long journey tomorrow. If you leave this palace without my permission, sorcerer, my brigade of witch hunters will hunt you with their hounds. Tomorrow morning, you shall assist me to perform magic for the benefit of my lords and ladies. And if anybody laughs at me, I shall have you beheaded. The king stormed back into the palace, leaving the charlatan alone and afraid. Not all his cunning could save him now, for he could not run away, nor could he help the king with magic that neither of them really knew. Seeking a vent for his fear, and his anger, the charlatan approached the window of Babati the washerwoman. Peering inside, he saw the old lady sitting at her table, polishing a wand. In the corner behind her, the king's sheets were washing themselves in a wooden tub. The charlatan understood at once that Babati was a true witch and that she, who had given him an awful problem, could also solve it. Crown! roared the charlatan. Your cackling has cost me dear. If you fail to help me, I shall denounce you as a witch, and it will be you who is torn apart by the king's hounds. Babati smiled at the charlatan and assured him that she would do everything in her power to help. The charlatan instructed her to conceal herself inside a bush while the king gave his magical display and to perform the king's spells for him without his knowledge. Babati agreed to the plan but asked one question. What, sir? if the king attempts a spell that Babati cannot perform. The charlatan scoffed. Your magic is more than equal to that fool's imagination, he assured her, and retired to the castle, well pleased with his own cleverness. The following morning, all the lords and ladies of the kingdom assembled in the palace grounds. The king climbed onto a stage in front of them with the charlatan by his side. I shall firstly make this lady's hat disappear, cried the king, pointing his twig at the noble woman. 
From inside a bush nearby, Babidi pointed her wand at the hat, caused it to vanish. Great was the astonishment and admiration of the crowd, and their loud applause for the jubilant king. Next, I shall make that horse fly, cried the twig, pointing the twig at his own steed. From inside the bush, Babati pointed her wand at the horse, and it rose high into the air. The crowd was more thrilled and amazed, and they roared their appreciation of the magical king. And now, said the king, looking all around for an idea. And the captain of the Brigade of Witch Hunters ran forward. Your Majesty, said the captain, this very morning, Saber died of eating a poisonous toadstool. Bring him back to life, Your Majesty, with your wand. And the captain heaved on the stage the lifeless body of the largest of the witch hunting hounds. The foolish king brandished his twig and pointed it at the dog. But inside the bush, Babidi smiled and did not trouble to lift up her wand, for no magic can raise the dead. When the dog did not stir, the crowd began first to whisper and then to laugh. They suspected the king's first two feats had been mere tricks after all. Why doesn't it work? The king screamed at the charlatan, who bethought himself of the only ruse left to him. There, your majesty, there! He shouted, pointing at the bush where Babati sat concealed. I see her, plain, a wicked witch who is blocking your magic with her own evil spells. Seize her! Somebody seize her! Babidi fled from the bush, and the brigade of witch hunters set off in pursuit, unleashing their hounds, ooh, who bayed for Babidi's blood. But as she reached a low hedge, the little witch vanished from sight. And when the king, the charlatan, and all their courtiers gained the other side, they found the pack of witch hunting hounds barking and scrabbling around a bent and aged tree. She has turned herself into a tree, screamed the charlatan. And dreading lest Babidi turn back into a woman and denounce him, he added, Cut her down, your majesty. That is the way to treat evil witches. An axe was brought at once, and the old tree was felled to loud cheers from the courtiers and the charlatan. However, as they were making ready to return to the palace, <laughs> The sound of loud cackling stopped them in their tracks. Fools! cried Babati's voice from the stunt they left behind. No witch or wizard can be killed by being cut in half. Take the axe, if you do not believe me, and cut the grand sorcerer in two. The captain of the Brigade of Witch Hunters was eager to make that experiment. But as he raised the axe, the charlatan fell to his knees, screaming for mercy and confessing all of his wickedness. As he was dragged away to the dungeons, the tree stump cackled more loudly than ever. <laughs> By cutting a witch in half, you have unleashed a dreadful curse upon your kingdom. It told the petrified king, henceforth, Every stroke of harm that you inflict upon my fellow witches and wizards will feel like an axe stroke on your own side until you will wish you could die of it. And that the king fell to his knees too and told the stump that he would issue a proclamation at once protecting all the wizards and witches of the kingdom and allowing them to practice their magic in peace. Very good, said the stump, but you have not yet made amends to Babati. Anything, anything at all, cried the foolish king, wringing his hands in fear before the stump. You will erect a statue of Babati upon 
me. In memory of your poor old washerwoman. And to remind you forever of your own foolishness, said the stump. The king agreed at once and promised to engage the foremost sculptor in all the land and have the statue made of purest gold. Then the Shane King told all the noble men and women to return to the palace, leaving the tree stump cackling behind them. When the grounds were deserted once more, there wiggled from a hole between the roots of the old tree stump a stout and whiskery rabbit with a wand clamped between her teeth. Babbity hopped out of the grounds and far away, and ever after a golden statue of the washerwoman stood upon that tree stump, and no witch or wizard was ever persecuted in the kingdom again. And there you have Rabbity Babbity. Thank you once again, and please join me for the Fountain of Fair Fortune. Till next time!